Hello, and welcome to Local Legacies, the show where we go behind the scenes with enterprising individuals who are striving for the best in their business, family, community, and themselves. I'm your host, Tim Lanza, and without further ado, here's this week's guest. All right, everybody, welcome. Thanks for joining us today. I have a very interesting guest here with me in the studio. Usually we talk to local business owners. I have someone here who has a little bit different story. They're a very prominent, prominent local environmentalist, um, someone who's taught me basically everything I know about nature and anything they haven't taught me is probably because I went out and was motivated to learn it on my own after he got me started. So it's my uncle, Peter Lanza here. How you doing today, Uncle Pete? Okay, how are you? I'm doing pretty good. A little damp out there. Yeah, it's a little rainy and a bit cold, too. Spring's coming. That's all right, yeah. So we got like a false spring. Oh, yeah, got all warm, the time. Got up to 60 and then back down. Does that, is that what happens? You think it's tomorrow you're going to be planting and you're shoveling. You exactly, know? exactly. Um, so I wanted to have you come in here and talk kind of about the environment in Lemonster, uh, projects that you've worked on, but why don't we start with your history, how you got to be in the position you're in? Well, I just was always interested in it. I mean, when I got out of college, I taught at Lemonster High, uh, and it's always been something I would grant to, and frankly, when my kids were born, it was a chance to do something in the schools to, as, a, as a volunteer to involve them and bring me back but it's all I, I can remember being very young and just wandering around in the woods and wondering because i was in the woods you know and i was at at that time that was not difficult to do where i grew up and the south end it's a lot more developed now but it, it's always been a, a source of uh, inspiration and awe it still is now, do you have any sort of formal education with ecology, the environment? No, not well. I, I've I've taken a lot of courses. I was on conservation for a while, and in that position, uh, like uh, what I would, they the Mass Conservation Mass Asso Mac Mass Association Conservation Commissions runs classes so you can get certified. So I took everything I could take. You know, and, and, and learned about uh, in terms of uh, conservation uh, laws because I it was on the commission. I want to educate myself. No one goes into these positions knowing anything, or most of the time they don't, but there was an opportunity there. And when I worked with uh, Congress of Lakes and Ponds as a, an officer and a board member and just a member for decades, we ran workshops every year that, you know, you could learn about well, in that case, pond ecology. Uh, Colap was a Congress of Lake and Pond. So, uh, and then just you know, I, I, I used to tell the kids in school, read, read. You know, you teach yourself a lot if you can read. Probably the best single thing you could ever learn is that. I found personally, I've done more learning probably in the last three years than I did in twelve or fifteen years of school, focused specifically on things I'm truly interested in and not necessarily what my educational background oh. was focused in. But that, that helps you, that going to school, though. I mean, I was an economics major. You know, at one point I thought might I, I might try law school. But it does, a, it, it does train you how to think. You know, you, it's, it's a toolbox, and you bring those tools. You solve problems based on your experience. And, and college, will, not that everybody has to go to college, but, you know, that teaching yourself, being taught, brings you get, get, it affects you it's it's like if you've ever had a great philosophy course you can't eat much with philosophy but it it does give you a mirror and, and it's a wall to bounce things off of uh and 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 think about and affects how you approach a problem you know uh, you, the scientific method you know with, with what you do now you you've got to know how to kind of mentally before you do it, take something apart <laughs> and remember how to put it back together, which is the hard part. And the more you look at problems in my case, and I see that uh, extrapolate out into other areas, like you kind of understand how the problem has evolved, why it oh, happened, yeah, and then yeah. you start to figure out how to fix it based on seeing it many, many yeah. times in different form. Most environmental issues didn't happen today. I mean, you do get events but that, that's the nature of uh, 
of the environment. You get, you know, sometimes catastrophe if an, uh, catastrophe in environment is actually an opportunity. You know, uh, it's when you get too many of them. But uh, that's, you know, you look back. It took when the pilgrims came here. If you read their readings, uh, one of the things they said was that this, this land is is. Uh, you can't scar it. It'll always heal. It will always heal. And the environment has been something that has been out there for people a lot of times to use because that thought is always there. You know, there'll always be enough water. There'll always be, well, that's that's not the reality. It's very complicated now, and and, uh, and we're paying the consequence of, of, you know, just using it without stewardship. Locally, how have you seen that play out? Well, probably the one of the great examples, and uh, you, you're not old enough to remember, but I remember what the National River looked like in, back in the '60s. It's a famous, famous picture uh, of what it looked like and what it looked like, you know, years later after the Clean Water Act passed. And frankly, Marion Stewart, who's been a hero or heroine, heroine I don't know what's proper now. Uh, of mine forever. I've, I had the opportunity to work with her on the Nashua River watershed. She, one person, took up the gauntlet and ran with it with, with great, uh, a lot of problems at first. And uh, that picture in the Nashua of, uh, of the before and after uh, was in a, an edition on water, which, if you can find it, I think it's available. I know only twice in the history of that magazine has there been a, a uh, an, an article or one subject published not on the monthly, the normal, and one of them was called Water, and the National Rivers featured in that. Well, I can remember when it, everybody talks about the colors. It, it smelled. It was, it, it was people dumped garbage, dye, whatever in it, you know. That's something you can see. As far as, like, the Minusna Brook, uh, First time we did a cleanup there, we used to have an annual cleanup. We took th three tons of trash out in a very small area. Uh, now there's a park down there, um, which uh, they made to a grant, but the original design we actually contributed to 30 years ago. When you, when you like something, it never happens fast enough, you know. But it's there. It's a, it's a, wonderful, it's a wonderful walk that we ultimately connect to the bike trail and, you know, get people out there. Uh, that was part of my philosophy in the schools is, you know, no one, no one's going to protect something they don't know about. So if they don't have the opportunity to learn, it doesn't have a significance. And we've removed ourselves, not everybody, but generally pretty far. We're insulated from the environment, you know. It, uh, so where's the interest of the education isn't there or the exposure. So it, the project you're referring to, the Manusnock Brook project, mm -hmm. can you explain how that came to be and what was involved with it? Well, it was a brainchild of the Nashua River Watershed Association where what the, the thought was to take, you know, when you look at the grand scale of the environment, how, to, how do you clean a river? Well, Marion figured it out, but it, part of the way she figured it out was you break it down into smaller pieces, and we wanted to focus on the Minusnook, uh, as which flows into the Nashua as a sub-watershed. Well, that's kind of the brook in your backyard type thing. There's two major watersheds in Lemonstow. One of them's Fall Brook, and the other one is Minusnook, and that, that one was changed, uh, chosen, uh, because it's more visible. Um, I actually live in the Fallbrook watershed, but the Minusnook is you know, it's downtown. People, a lot of people don't know it's there, but it's more visible. Uh, and we thought it would attract uh, more attention. It flows through Sears Town. Uh, we had huge support from uh, Ed Gagney, who's unfortunately passed away. Gagney Enterprises helping us out then at uh, with now the Walt Mall at Whitney Field for Sears Town then. And uh, you know, gave us financial support and just, uh, especially in the schools. You know, we uh, hired people and uh, it's mostly a volunteer effort. But 
I mean, that's where the brook was, three tons of trash. That's, that was over three. If, if you can envision it, we could have filled more than three school buses. And we didn't go far from the center of town to pick that trash up. The last time we did it, which was a couple of years ago, uh, I got sick, uh, which is not the point, but uh, we picked up less than a ton uh, over a broader area. Uh, that's stewardship. That's taking care of it and making people aware of it. And, and uh, that's what we've got to do with the environment. You can't, it's not one of those things that you can say, oh, it's great now. You clap your hands and walk away. It's a process. Ongoing. And it's always going. It's always going, you know. I think that with nature and the environment and a lot of things that you hear, you know, say on the news and what they're talking about, whether it's global warming or these things, you have people that say, well, th that's nice, but I don't care. I've got my own problems. I'm, I've got, you know, they're driving a gas car, which obviously I work in the business of gas cars, but, you know, I they don't have time to deal with these things. But to me, littering or just cleaning up the environment right around you, it's like if you're peeing in your own house, you wouldn't pee on the floor. Yeah. You know, it's put put the trash where it belongs, clean up, take care of your space that you're living in every day. That is probably the first simplest, cheapest, and and best thing you can do is just pick up. You know, what? I, I it, it appalls me when you go down, like... Uh, well, it's actually, it's Lidgefield Street. People don't see it as that. But by, by the way, the New Limits, the TV building is there. and or, or by the dam where I live. And I, I pick it up and people throw more trash. It just it drives me nuts, you know. I mean, they carry it around in their pocket all day and throw it out the window. <laughs> right. You know, you know uh, it's, it, I, 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 I don't know, but it's, I, the pl people, you, some of the nicest places you've seen, one of the things that makes them nice, be it a city or an urban environment or a natural environment, is that they're clean. Right. I mean, it's, it's nice, you know. I mean, what's, you know, and, and when we did the cleanup, that was good. A lot of people just, you know, we put up a sign and people showed up, and, and people were willing to do that. Uh, we didn't call 50 people, you know, but they'd show up that day and, and felt good about it. It was it was a it was a great experience. Who did your work workforce consist of, as far as people that were helping and well, cleaning up? Well, we had people that showed up because we had a sign down on the fence, downtown at the Brook that said, you know, Brook cleanup, and we'd have the date in there. And if, if I was lucky, I'd get an article, uh, in a, the Champion or something before the cleanup. Uh, people did, after didn't really matter. I mean, we had one guy, like I said, I worked there. It was about almost 30 years. He was there every every time. And we got a lot of business. Uh, businesses were very good about, uh, you know, giving us some money because we, uh, I made T-shirts, and I made them because I couldn't afford to hire, to pay somebody to make them, where we, we got sponsors. And then we did projects in the school that that, Paid for the school projects uh, for for years, you know that one thing. And the local businesses were were very very good about you know I'm not going to get into a dollar amount, you know whatever they could give they gave, and uh, I think you're the proud owner of some of those shirts. <laughs> <laughs> I I've got a couple myself. The, the, the list on the back who 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 chipped in, and people would just show up, and it was just a you know. Uh, uh, the, uh, obviously, there's a desire to, you know, do something for somebody else, do something for the environment, do something to be participate with other people. And and we had plenty of people that, my God, they they were there for the uh, almost the entire thirty years that we ran the cleanups. Part of my reason for doing this is in this podcast. I have a business in this area, you know, locally. I live locally. Why would I not do whatever I can to try to make it the best? Yeah, the community it, spirit. Right, exactly. It can exist. And, and it's a way for people to, no matter what they may think about other things, come together and be part of that experience. You know, it's being on a team is great. I mean, if, if, if you got to, you don't always win, but the team feeling is a good feeling. And, uh, 
you know, it's like uh, teaching and having a class come together, or you know, but that that uh, that was good, and we did a we did a lot, like I said, a lot in the schools. We go into the classroom and try to do hands-on stuff, and I took literally thousands of hikes with kids over the course of the years, and it it was a great not only learning about the environment, but you need a skill set to deal with that environment. You know, you it ends up u using math and English, and I mean, I'm not going to get into all the kind of different lessons we did, but the, the kids were very enthusiastic about it. And that toolbox that I mentioned before, they have to go to that toolbox and take out that, that thing that they could write with. I need my writing tool. I need my math tool. I need my organizational tool. So it's, uh, environmental education is a real cross-curriculum appeal and a hands-on appeal that people like. They use it. I mean, hands-on is, to me, is one of the best ways. You can get real bored in a classroom sometimes, you know. Well, and I found nature, hiking, being out in the wilderness is a beautiful place to be. And as you said, needing a tool set, it's also very dangerous. And there's different things that you can come across or interact with that can create a bad situation. So helping to kind of make people understand what they're dealing with and how to deal with it. Yeah, yeah, you know, I mean, again, you add to your knowledge set. Uh, I can't think of anything terrible that's happened to me, you know. Bad case of poison ivy. Uh, but th but that's part of learning, you know. My, my, my son went and camped in New Zealand. He worked in a, the jungles of Malaysia. I mean, you, you got to be aware of your environment any place. You know, so what's the difference? It you know, it's just a di different knowledge, you know. Didn't take me long to learn to not flip a log up away from myself. Never roll it away from yourself. <laughs> Found a ground hornet's nest under one of them. Yeah, yeah. We do a lot of practical little things like that when we went out, but it's, uh, you know, it's too bad more kids don't get out when they're, when they're younger. And, 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 you know, I'd say to say, hey, who's taking a walk in the woods? And two, three hands would go up and well, you know, you, you, your capacity to learn, being older now, I realize my capacity to learn seems to be a hell of a lot less. When kids are young, they're very open to taking in a lot of different ideas and having that exposure. Not that everybody's going to turn out to be, you know, an environmental scientist, but to appreciate it and enjoy it, you know, is, is huge in your life. You drive down the road and you see things differently when you expose yourself to them. You know, uh, you think differently, you know, and it's, it's nice, you know. What was that like for you being able to work with kids? I mean, did you find that rewarding? Obviously, you did it quite a bit. Well, you'd have to talk to the kids first. Uh, I, I, I enjoyed it, but I, I like working with kids. I, I, it's, you know, uh, and I taught high school, too, at one point. Uh, and I, I like working with young people. I, I find them generally more open-minded than, we'll say, grown-ups for the lack of any other word. Uh, you know, I, th I think they, and, and it, it seemed to work for me. No one's thrown anything at me yet, so when I run into a former student, it's it's a nice experience, you know, it, so, but it's just, you know, something I enjoyed. I kind of fell into it because I couldn't get a job. I got out of college, I didn't have a job, and I had a chance to substitute teach for a year, and, uh, it turned into, you know, I won't say a career because I didn't do it all. I did taught photography, and but again, that uh, taught under 766 down the Cape. Um, but it it just gave me a. Uh, it's kind of hard to describe. People who like teaching like it. Look what teachers are going through now with COVID and everything. This is a really challenging. It's challenging for everybody. But it's a very difficult thing uh, not to be in the classroom. You know, you like that something special goes on when you you see eyes light up and ideas bounce off and arguments and, you know, perspectives and you know, you're spinning the gears in your head. It's good. It's a good thing. Did when you, you look back, you think of, I'm sure you can pick out great teachers. No, they all weren't great, but you think of the ones that change your life. Some of these people, they change people's lives. You can definitely, I think, pick out individual teachers. I can certainly in my past. And I think 
you know, what's great about what you did. And I specifically remember them, although I spent a lot of time doing this with you outside of school, is doing those nature walks were such a difference from what was being done day to day. You get out of the classroom, yeah. you know, it's a field trip, but it's a lot more than that. And it's, you're a lot more connected directly to the environment around you. And you, they, you know, they, 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 everybody sees things, you know, a little differently too. So one person will pick up on a certain part of, uh, you know, a leaf or something, you know, and, and, and you go, wow, you know, like, I, I, you know, if you teach, you learn. You, you learn as much as you teach, you know, and, and the kids have great, not just kids, even adults, you know, see things that you, you don't see, and it opens up your perspective, you know, it's sharing, you know. Now, obviously, I've been out of the local school system, at least for quite some time. How much of this goes on now? Are you still working with schools? or No, I'm not. Uh, you know, just the way things evolved. And like I said, I ran into a couple of medical issues. And uh, uh, I had, uh, you know, a, a, a lot of interest that, that just, it just, it's just, I haven't been able to keep it going. And I, one of the things I, I am not good at uh, was uh, finding somebody to kind of pass it on to, but that's that's an equation. It has you know it's a formula involved with not only teaching, but you have to have the interest. You try to provide a kind of a product if you look like it on on a business level, but you got to have you know a performer needs an audience at some point. Uh, uh, a product needs to be sold or consumed or used or whatever. So you that that balance and. So many other things take over, you know, DMcast or um, whatever, and, and, and it's, it changes. It's a very dynamic process. If someone like you, maybe slightly younger, were to come yeah, in. Yeah, a lot longer, you'd be good. <laughs> slightly younger, <laughs> were to come in today and provide that product, like, the, you know, the way you're kind of describing it, what would that look like? Well, my... my <laughs> the only product I know was the one I did. I, I had great uh, interest on, on the level of the the teachers, uh, you know, and, and it kind of it grew uh, that way through. I had worked in to one extent or another in all of the schools in Lummets, and you know those teachers move on. Uh, I, I think that. Uh, you try and meet their needs. You know how how can you use environmental education to teach math? You know, no no teacher comes knowing everything. Uh, if you can, so if if you you help them, it just it's seed planting. I mean that's what education is. And if they it works for them, and you get the support, you need the support. You know, because you're coming in as an outsider, but. Schools can the curriculums, you know. I, I don't know. I, I was lucky. I kind of did what I wanted to do with it, and, and it worked. So, uh, if someone else was coming in, uh, you know, you got to meet the standards you, and all those types of things. Um, go with your heart. You know, like anything you believe in, then you'll do a good job. You, you know, go, go with your heart. You know, if you get mechanical, who, who cares? No, no, off. No. I don't mean to insult the mechanic, you know, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I think you know what I mean. You know, well, you, hopefully. I mean, it's not what you're going to make. I volunteered, you know, and but you know, and, and who the hell doesn't want to make some money? You, know, you gotta survive, and you want to do things. But you know, Thoreau Thoreau said most men live lives of quiet desperation, and that's kind of sad, you know. And, and uh, but very true. And it is, it is. Necessity is necessity, but, you know. Well, hopefully there's someone listening to this that will be inspired to take some sort of action involving that. You know, I, it was extremely impactful in my life, and I think it would be to others. And as we talked about earlier, keeping the community clean, those are seeds you're planting early on that I would never throw trash yeah. out the window because of... Yeah. Well, you what I learned at a very young age. You, get, you try and get people invested in something. That doesn't mean they can carry it to the nth degree, but it, it has a level of importance in their life as opposed to something that doesn't matter at all. 
you know, in it's we live in a really intense. Yeah, I haven't traveled much, uh, but I remember being uh, talking to people. My son took me to Belize for Father's Day. We went for a week, and it was amazing. Uh, and we did the nature thing, so you know, I mean, we didn't go clubbing, but but it, it, how how relaxed some people much more than Americans are. We always seem to be worried about the next thing. I haven't finished this one yet. You know, you get out in, the, in nature and you can actually take that breath and go back with a cleaner, you know, fresher uh, view on things. You know, that, that recreation thing. Now, we obviously have talked about the Manusnock Brook and that's right downtown, but it's people locally were trying to explore some places where they could disconnect a little bit more get back into a, a recreation type environment, get into nature, what would you recommend? Well, the brook walks right downtown, but the, 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 the trustees of reservations, uh, Dick O'Brien in particular, because of him, there's some wonderful, wonderful trails. You can hike, you, you could start up at Sholin Farms and hike all across the trails on that ridge and end up near Kmart. There's a tremendous trail system up there that you can do part of it, you can do some of it. Uh, some pretty neat views of Lemonster. Uh, and just, you know, every time you go, you see something different or you see it differently. It's, it's a, such a dynamic. Right, right now, uh, as things start to warm up, for a few weeks, for example, there are no leaves on the trees. They're just starting to bud. Well, the whole process is going on in the, the forest forest floor because the sunlight can reach the forest floor and things are going to happen there that aren't going to happen in a few weeks when those leaves come out and it there'll be something else there that's different and uh, so every time you go out there's something else you know the winter time uh, I know my son and I used to love to track it just you know go out and see the activity in the snow or the the behavior of the animals. It's I, I, its neat stuff to me. It's always fascinated me. So another good quote that I've always loved is, no man ever steps in the same river twice because it's not the same river and he's not the same man. And that's, that's, tr that's true. Even on a purely scientific level, if I, I go out and do water testing tomorrow morning, most certainly it's going to be different at noontime and 6 o'clock, let alone next week. Because it's a, it's a dynamic system. Uh, not all changes are obvious, but they are there. Now, you mentioned something to me the other day when we were talking about ecotourism. The ecotourism is a, it's a great dollar. It's a great dollar because uh, you it, it it doesn't. <laughs> You don't have to build schools and fire departments and police departments and all that. I mean, I think the Nashua River, uh, at one point, I know uh, the city was looking into doing some sort of, you know, events on the Nashua River. Uh, you know, peop you, know it, uh, you look at something like a soccer complex in Lancaster. People come, they have soccer, they go down the street to a restaurant, they may stay at a hotel if it's a tournament. And ecotourism is a good dollar because it, it, it doesn't place well, can you some of the demands. Can you explain, like, for people listening, kind of what ecotourism could be a river is? Trip. And could yeah. be a river trip. You know, something that you talk about the natural. It could be, you know, some sort of how many campgrounds are there, you know, that, uh, that, that, that don't always necessarily, I mean, it's got to be done right like anything, but it, it puts less stress or can put less stress on the environment and yet provide, you know, income. You know, you got to live and it takes money. But uh, that bike trail that they're building now from Fitchburg to Lemonster, I mean, people will get out, you know. People will come to, when I lived on the Cape, people would drive to the Cape to take bicycle trails. Right, you the know? rail trail. They were spending money there, right? you know. And and they were in. Uh, you'll find groups form like groups form to make the bike trail. It took you know a long time, 
uh, that park down at uh, downtown next to Rollstone Bank now. That we were talking about that 30 years ago. You know, making that park. Well, you know, if you go and you sit for a minute, you have that pause. I remember when we were on the Brook Project one time. Was we had some people from from France who came in. I talked about how much they've they adore their their uh, streams and what they have around them. Uh, cities have made walks along, you know, uh, streams and brooks that come in the town, and people, you know, they they spend money, they enjoy, they relax, and hopefully that bike trail when it's done, that'll. That's a neat connection to Lemonster. I think it's in Fitchburg. It's it's going to be great. Uh, now you were saying earlier, the etymology of the word recreation. Explain yeah. kind of what you were saying well, about that. You know, I, I can remember when I taught English. Uh, Julius Caesar, we, we you know where somebody was where they went out to recreate themselves. They were out in the country. Recreation is re is recreating yourself, and you get out and do that. You know, might be might be a campfire in your backyard, you know, and 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 you be, you give yourself that opportunity to take a breath, you know, and and you know, sounds corny, but smell of roses or whatever, and that that word recreation really comes. That's what the goal was, and it's etymology is the, the opportunity to recreate yourself. You know, you. Uh, you know, you may find it in a museum, you know. Yeah, I, I find it a lot in nature, you know. I don't think there's a day that goes by that, you know. Oh, the other day, for example, about, well, about two weeks ago, uh, I looked out my window, and there were two adult and two juvenile uh, eagles sitting in a tree in front of my house, and I was like, oh, my God, who, who can I tell? I got, I got to call somebody. You know, I got I got to tell them because I knew they weren't going to sit there, uh, and you see that. that. You know that for me that works. You know it means it's it's significant. You know, uh, often when you're not expecting it, you know you you it just happens. You know something shows up, and it's it's a neat moment. You know, kind of makes you forget your problems. Right. You know, uh, that can overtake your life. You know, you just enjoy it. A lot of things that I try to do in an effort to improve my own life, I tie back to evolution or an evolutionary model and how many hundreds of thousands of years were we deeply connected to nature. You know, there was no light pollution to look up at the stars at night. You were out and you see that if you're either sitting by a fire or you're out camping yeah. or you get to sleep under the stars, it just I changes think, you. I think one of the lessons that has been forgotten is that the environment supports us. We don't support the environment. As we, as we become more technologically involved, um, we forget that. And, and as a result, we don't pay attention to the things that sustain us. Um, clean air and clean water. I mean, you know, the improvements in uh, there have been tremendous, tremendous. When, when I look back, when I was a kid, you know, a measurable asthma rate in the state of Massachusetts uh, because of pollution that was occurring in Ohio and ending up in our environment, ponds becoming sterile, becoming highly acidified. And, you, you know, you can't, you keep pulling out a, somebody described it one time as pulling rivets out of a spaceship, you know, at a certain point, it fails, you know. So, you know that that I think it's important that. Uh, and who doesn't want clean water, and clean air? You know, it's kind of kind of important to, you know, uh, any anybody who's had to suffer through a great uh, you know uh, poisoning of, of of things like the earth or the. Uh, oh, I had a, one years ago. We had a young man. He was becoming a priest came to eat at our house and he was from Poland and he couldn't get over the food because, you know, I'm not, I'm not talking about my cooking. I'm talking about maybe he couldn't get over that either. But the abundance of, of food. And he said where he came from in Poland, he said, we can't eat the vegetables because the because of war that had been conducted there, 
the soil was so poisoned that the vegetables weren't safe to eat. I mean, that's you know, that's that's sad. You know, it's sometimes aggravating, but it's you know, it, it just shows you what we, we can do or not do. You know, so. Well, people, I think, are so disconnected from where their food even comes from. Oh yeah, definitely. Go yeah. a little garden. We're we're lucky in our family. Uh, you know, I'm. Uh, we are particularly connected to people that garden and grow vegetables during the warmer months. Yeah, but, we like to eat. And we, we love to eat. <laughs> but I think especially when it comes to meat products, it's like chicken isn't grown in a cellophane package yeah. in the back of Victory well, Market. Well, we never see the process. We see the product. I mean, that's mm-hmm. part of the benefit and deficit of modern living, you know. So, uh, But it can be done. I mean, it's not like, you know what happens all the time, and I, I run into this argument with people uh, is that it's like either the environment or the economy. Now, frankly, my my major in college was, despite all we've been talking about, my major was in economics. It's not an either-or. And right now, we seem to live in such an either-or world. Either you get the economy or you're going to put... Th- those things are not mutually exclusive, but it's, it's, it's often looked at that way, you know? I mean, look at the improvements in your business, you know, how much less polluting a car is than it used to be. Right, drastic. You know? Well, wh- what's the matter with that? You know, that, that's fine. The air is better, you got your car. And if you look at Tesla, which I am am a big fan of, I mean, I love my gas cars, but what I really admire about Tesla is he created a superior product. He used economics and created a product that people wanted independently of its environmental impact. You know, there's... The, my analogy is a, is the old milking stool. All right, it's got three legs. One of those legs is economic. One of those legs is environmental, and one of those legs is cultural. So you can't sit on that stool with all three of those legs. You got to have a good economy. You want to have a healthy environment, and you want people to accept those decisions. So if a culture wouldn't accept it, you can't go to India and serve hamburgers that is not within their cultural perspective. You have to respect that, you know, so something doesn't get shoved down somebody's throat, you know. But it'll all work. The, the stool will be quite sturdy if if you look at different, uh, different and, and go with it working. How are you going to make it work? How can you make, I mean, there are plenty of people out there who have very successful businesses that are, that are culturally and economically aware. I mean, I remember when I bought my first Prius, people would stop me, you know, and say, wow, you know, what's that like? Because uh, I stopped people, too, before I bought one because it was my money I was spending. I didn't want to buy a lemon, and uh, it works. It works. I'm, I can't tell you how pleased I am with, you know, with, and I, I've got my transportation, and I've got it, so... But it's hard for people to change their ways, and that includes me. But that's how I look at it, that analogy, and it's a good yardstick to hold up to. Is this a good idea, you know? If you want to start a business, you want it to survive, obviously, you know? Uh, now, on a local level, tying that back into business, I mean, something I'm particularly interested in is looking at the history of Lemonster, obviously a major plastics town, huge manufacturing that led to a lot of pollution in the area. We've kind of transitioned out of that. As you mentioned, we've, the pollution has gotten better. The environment's been cleaned up. Those businesses have either disappeared or gone elsewhere. Where do you think the town and the surrounding areas, the city of Lemonster, where are we going now, both business and environmentally, what needs to happen? Well, if none of has been as involved lately in it, my Again, I'll go back to my analogy. Uh, you need good jobs. You need good jobs. That's important. Uh, and and I, I think in this current environment, uh, you know, because everybody's expo- so exposed to the uh, the virus where things are shut down and the, the ripples and impacts. Uh, um, I know you and I, as I've, I have worked in the, Restaurant business, uh, it's, you need that, you need a mix. 
if nature can teach you something, uh, it will teach you that there's, there's, a, there's a health in diversity. Uh, when a system I mentioned before about, you know, sometimes there's a, a tragedy in, in nature, there's a catastrophe in nature, and the system suffers. But if that same system has diversity, and I mean that on multiple levels, um, culturally, economically, um, it can survive and, and, and grow back. If it, you know, a single cell organism is destroyed by one event, a multi celled organism will have a chance to survive. So that's one of the, na the lessons I've drawn from nature is, is that a business that can diversify has a better chance of surviving because it, everything goes through hard times. And and uh, now more than ever. Oh yeah, well now, With, well you know, uh, just like that. When you think it's been a year, and at the same time, it seems like yesterday. That and, and look what happened with this virus. I mean, New York City. It was it was horrible. Where my daughter was going to school, she was in New York City. She was, she was in New York, and she called me when they brought in refrigerator trucks with bodies. I mean, wow. I mean, it, it just was overwhelming. You know. Uh, and scary, you know. I mean, we can we can bounce back, and we will, but at, at, the, at a great cost. Uh, lack of, you know, everybody's got fifty fifty. Uh, you know, third twenty twenty hindsight. You know, when Monday morning quarterback, you right? Know, we should have, we could have. Not doesn't matter now. We just gotta hopefully learn from it, and get stronger, and pass that knowledge down. It's funny how humans are not good at passing knowledge. We relearn the hard way. So History you know? repeats itself. Yeah. Well, like Ken Bird said, it, it it may not repeat itself, but it sure rhymes. <laughs> you know? So, you know, hopefully this won't be forgotten, and you know, we we'll stop splitting each other up. Now, on go, you know a local level, or let let me give you an example. I guess you've got someone who is maybe a single mother taking care of a couple kids, working 50, 60 hours a week. She's barely making rent in her apartment, doesn't have a backyard, just has a patch of cement where they park cars. Why would she care about any of this? Uh, I don't know. You, ho you hope something reaches her. Uh, it may be through you know family, friends, uh, may belong to an organization uh, that gets a little support. Maybe she takes a walk down by the brook. We keep going back to the brook and sees something and, and, and finds it. It's, 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 it's really a challenging time. Uh, hopefully the, the schools where her children, single mother, she's got a child, that there'll be an opportunity in the schools to, uh, one of the things, to, to, to have an experience, one of the things that, Actually, I wrote the original curriculum for the Nash River Watershed. Uh, it used to do a, a river trip with the kids. Uh, and the kids would go out and they canoe and, you know, day trip from the schools. That was an opportunity for a lot of kids who would never, never, I'm lucky, my kids grew up on a pond, uh, go out and, and do that. And when I used to go on those trips, the parents, we always tried to get parents to come. This is a great idea. This is a great idea. Well, don't tell me. I, I know. That's why I'm here. Tell the principal. Tell the administration. Uh, and and look at the enthusiasm of the kids, you know. Uh, if there are programs out there that can be taken advantage of, uh, you know, not everybody can send their kid to the camp, but those, those trips, like the PTO, I would go to them to help sponsor the trip. Uh, you know, so it didn't wasn't money out of somebody's pocket, but opportunity in it, and I mean that's part of hopefully a, a society that gives provides opportunity. Uh, would she care? She's probably going to care about her kid. You know, she, she wants her kid to. Have, everybody wants their children to do well and do better, and you know, so that's just that's part of an opportunity that hopefully you know when like I said the PTOs would support it. The watershed would run it. Uh, great program. They're still doing it. Um, 
you know, that that's the type of thing uh, that, that I think is one one way to do it. You know, the, the library presents programs. You know, R right? You, you, know, yep. uh, you know, I think you can. The thing is, if these programs get support, they'll flourish. If they don't, they're going to be like an unwatered plant. They're going to just die. You know? On the other side of that equation, let's say you've got a family who has a huge house, six-figure earners, nice backyard. You know, maybe this winter they went to Colorado, they go to national parks, they see some of the best places in the U.S. as far as nature goes. Why would they care about Leminster or their, where they live? Like, why, why should that be important to them? Well, I would hope it would be important, frankly, because I think that anybody's – Anybody's success, financially, whatever, the way you want to do it, uh, however, however you want to look at it, depends a great deal on, on opportunities that they either created or were given, but they were supported. You know, everybody stands, whether we want to admit it or not, next to one another and on each other's shoulders. And I would hope there would there'd be some sort of moral sense that they, uh, they have uh, – because they did well, you know. Okay, that, it's that that simple, you know. Uh, a lot of business in Lummis have, uh, have supported, like the watershed, or supported the projects I did. You know, they that was a way of giving back. I think that should be part of our mentality. Frankly, give you know. Uh, every time I sit around and feel sorry for myself, which I'm good at. Uh, I think about other people and go, wow, you know, you look at the news and go, oh, my God, you know, what, how do you live like that? You know, like this COVID thing we'll, we'll get through. There are people who sit through years and years of, you know, you hope you don't forget when you get there, if you get there, of, of you know, years and years of tragedy and all that. And uh, I would hope somebody on that end appreciated their, appreci simply appreciated what they have and, and, uh, wanted to spread the literal and figurative wealth uh, um, in support organizations, if not individuals that that do things that, you know, cast your bread upon the waters. And, and uh, it, 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 you know, it truly will be of benefit uh, to everybody. We got to learn to be a society, uh, you know, and not just cleave. Uh, so... And I think sometimes they just have an innate interest in that, you know, no matter what they do, you know. Uh, well, we seem to be all deeply connected to nature, whether you, it's, a, it's just a matter of how aware you are of it. Yeah. Well, stewardship. Yeah, awareness is important. Awareness is important. Uh, no question about it. You know, that's why when you get a trail system, like pe people drive to limits there to go to Shoreland Farms. I mean, Shawland Farms, when they think they have events, it's it's unbelievable. Yeah, it's great, you know. But they're out there, you know. They're outside, and, and there's this this stuff. And it be, you know, sometimes your own backyard is the last place you look. And and uh, you know, I recommend the trail system, and you know, they're always looking for volunteers too, and uh, trustees, and you know, people in city hall on conservation. Uh, and these people are giving their time because they believe in it and and want to see it passed on. You know, because it, once it's gone, it's gone. There's no no question about that. With all the other needs that we have, be they real or perceived. Well, I think that's probably a good place to wrap up. I just want to say thank you for everything you've done in my life personally. Oh. You know, you've inspired me and taught me an incredible amount about nature and the world around me. And I think you've done it for a lot of other people as well. So I appreciate that. And I want to hopefully get this out there and inspire someone else to maybe take your place or get involved or just be a little bit more conscious about what's going on around them. Oh, thank you. It's always nice to be thanked. So, alrighty, thanks for coming in, Uncle Pete. I appreciate it. All right, no problem. Thank you.
Thank you for tuning in with us. We do this to share the stories of some of the incredible individuals in your community. All we ask in return is if you found value from this episode, please share it with someone else who may also gain value from the show. Please feel free to rate or review the show. Your feedback helps us give you more of what you want. Until next time, I'm Tim Lanza, and this was another Local Legacy.